All right. I'm so excited to be here with um, Peter, the VP of Product and Partnerships at OpenAI, a day after the GPT-4 um, launch, one of the most uh, exciting launches, I think, ever in uh, Silicon Valley. So congratulations, Peter. Thank thanks you so much, me. and thanks for, for, for having me. Super excited to chat. All right, so I know you're busy, and we have limited time, and we, we crowdsourced way too many questions, so I'm just going to rapid fire them at you, if that's all right. Um, yeah, let's do, so it. let's do it. So first question is, uh, what are some specific applications of GPT-4 that you and your team are most enthusiastic about? Um, I think I mean there, there there are tons of them, but like just to call out a few, like one one thing that I one that I really thought was super cool was uh, be my eyes, who is using kind of the visual uh, inputs to GPT four to to help visually impaired people. I mean it's like you know computer vision used to be this thing where you you did object recognition and so on, and suddenly you can do much more. You can like ask like hey. Is something wrong in my outfit? Something I should fix, or you know, I have these ingredients. What should I cook? You know, like like it's a whole opens up a whole new kind of um, kind of just range of applications. And you're originally a vision guy, right? That must be wild to see this this approach work so well. <laughs> That's right. It's sort of crazy. Like yeah, all we did was language models. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay. D does a lot of prompt engineering become redundant given the larger context length and the ability to supply more in context examples in the prompt? Oh yeah, this, this is super interesting. I I sort of feel like I I I keep on thinking that something is both right and wrong with prompt engineering. Like you know, ultimately, prompt engineering when we should think about it, we should think about it's like you know how how good at it are you at just specifying tasks? Like a good manager should be able to tell you know their employee whatever this is your job, this is what you should work on. It shouldn't be super much ambiguity, and that's usually that's kind of what. Uh, what what prompt engineering is about, but like this ability to just have a conversation with the model and like fix it, like no 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 that was too formal or no like uh, make it live upbeat, add a joke here, you know like that sort of interaction. That's how I think we would kind of think about language models much more than like adding lots of examples or like writing very specified instructions. Like let's just have a conversation with the model and it will kind of pick up on what I want over time. Totally makes sense. All right, now here's a question we got the most in different forms, but why did you guys not, why weren't you able to keep the training data uh, on more up to, the training of GPT-4 on more up-to-date data? Oh yeah, so that's that's such an interesting uh, uh, question. Like, th so ultimately, you know, training these these models just <laughs> take a long time. Uh, so that's that's ultimately the answer here is this, that, you know, I, I, can't, I can't tell you exactly how long it took to train this, but like there's there's processes here of like, at some point you're doing testing on certain kinds of data, and then you want to lock down that data um, uh, uh, and not change it too much. So you can really trust that when you run the big kind of training run, nothing's going to go, go wrong. That just means that you're going to have stale data at some point. Obviously, like getting fresh data into the models is a pretty big um, kind of uh, question that we get over and over and over again. So it's it's something that's definitely on top of our mind to kind of fix going forward. But that ultimately, that is um, you know it just takes time to train these models. Okay, all right. Um, considering that GPT four is multimodal now, do you imagine future foundation models to be multimodal by um, design? And I guess do you have any? comments on what the biggest blockers were when introducing the multimodal component? Yeah, um, th that's a good question. I, 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 I definitely think that like multimodal is sort of the future. Um, like this is, you, you just give the models abilities to understand many more concepts. They kind of understand things like, uh, you know, uh, you know, physics concepts based on looking at images, or they can understand if, like, you can imagine eventually these models kind of dealing with more modalities like audio and and so on. Like, it's pretty clear that the future here is is just more and more more uh, uh, kind of multimodal models, um, uh, and and you know, some components are already there today. Like with Whisper, you can take um, you know, you can take audio and turn it into text and so on. So it's it's it, like all of these things eventually will will get connected. I think in terms of challenges, you know, um, I, 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 I would confess here that I wasn't on the research team that did a lot of the amazing work to get uh, GPT V working, but I, I just know that, you know, going, uh, scaling, going from like small models to like these, these enormous models that GPT-4 is, is, is that's like a, a huge challenge in itself. You kind of need to do a lot of science to understand like on smaller models to see like, here's how good it is and here's how good it's going to be when we scale it up. 
Um, and that's, that it just requires a lot of like very detailed kind of investigations and so on. And uh, a lot of kind of uh, like just, just hard work, which, which that team did. Totally. Were there any new like specific challenges with GPT-4 different than previous models? Or is it just sort of like trying to get even another level of scale? Um, you know, I ultimately it is, you know, just an, an, another level of scale. But I would say that we work in like all aspects of that, whether it's data, whether it's how to most efficiently use the compute, architectures of models and so on. all of these things are things that we kind of tune and tweak um, uh, continuously. So, so, uh, but ultimately it's, it, I mean, b big part of it is really being able to scale. And as you scale every order of magnitude, there's just more and more things that break, even in your infrastructure, you know? And so, you know, we have a, just an incredibly talented, um, infrastructure engineering team, uh, that is like made up of both engineers and researchers that are, have built this incredible system for being able to train these models. And there's just so many little things that you need to get right, because if you have a bug somewhere, you know, it's, it's going to propagate immediately. And so like, you know, I think one of the biggest like mantras <laughs> essentially that team has is like, don't, don't have bugs, you know, which is like, seems like the most hardest thing to do as a software engineer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> good advice though. Don't have bugs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so here's another question. I don't even know if it's, it's fully, um, formed, but you know, in the, do you have a sense or a guess of like the order of magnitude of experiments running in a typical day, like in the, the weights and biases notion of experiments, like training something, is it like, like a handful or millions or where, what do you think it is? Uh, it's a good question. You know, I, I would say like, there's probably on the order of like, uh, I, I don't know, like somewhere between 100 and 200 people essentially doing some sort of research at OpenAI. And each of them are, you know, probably running on the order of like a few experiments per week. So that probably makes it like multiple hundreds of experiments per week. Like some of them will take, like some experiments take, take weeks, some experiment <laughs> takes like hours, right? But right. it's sort of like, that's probably the order of magnitude. Got it. Okay. Um, to the extent that you can comment, um, what was the most useful type or source of data for training GPT-4? Oh, um, I mean, it's it. I I feel like this. It's just like the text on the internet is probably <laughs> the, the answer here. You know, we just these these models are just incredibly data hungry. So just finding more and more and more of this. Like we have a whole team that's just like basically focused on like how can we bring more data into these these models. So uh, I think at this point it's like almost to some extent it's like less about the particular data, more about more data. You know. Um, <laughs> So that's probably how I would think about it. Is there any um, particular task? I mean, I saw all these tasks that, you know, you, you showed uh, GPT-4 getting better at. Is there any task where, like, you know, it's been surprisingly hard given, um, you know, how impressive, like, all these, like, every version of LLMs is? Anything stand out as, like, you would have thought it would have gotten solved uh, by an earlier version? Oh, that's a good question. I, I mean, it is still surprising to me I, I feel like I feel at this point like GPT-4 is quite good at just doing mental or arithmetic and stuff like that. But like you know, it took all the way to GPT-4 to kind of get it to be fairly robust at that. It would just make these silly mistakes for even up to three point five. You know, uh, and it's still you know just to be clear, it still makes some silly mistakes. Uh, but you know, it's like the way I look at it, it's kind of weird almost like a weird savant in some sense, right? Like it has these amazing capabilities on some dimensions and then makes these like incredibly stupid mistakes that a human just wouldn't make unless the human is drunk or something, right? Like, but that's sort of like, that's what it feels like sometimes with, with the model. It's like, you kind of never know, did you get the, the kind of early morning version or like the late at night after multiple drinks version? And like, this, the weirdest thing about this is that sometimes like even like, uh, prompting the model, it seems to matter. Like if you tell the model, hey, you're a genius at math, it would do better at math if, than if you tell it, it's like, you're not very good at math, right? Like it's- oh, really? so it's, so you, can't, think... you can't like prod it, it like you can't get it riled up and then <laughs> make it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so the, the models are like, it's still very uh, vulnerable to this this stuff, kind of stuff. So, uh, but, uh, but I think that's like, you know, that's one thing I think it is, I mean, it's like, um, uh, it's it's also funny. You might have seen in the uh, in 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 Greg Brockman's demo that he did, like you know, the whole thing about like summarizing with a single letter, uh, the same letter starting every every word. I mean, it's kind of 
you know, it's, so, it's sort of weird how it just happens that once you reach a certain scale, it kind of just gets it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think there's a, there's a number of those where it's just like, it's kind of weird how you just, it, it, you know, I think it's kind of called uh, grokking, this phenomenon where you train it, train and train, it doesn't do very well. And then suddenly it just gets it. Something kind of, it forms some set representation and just kind of gets it. Uh, and so there's been a few of those. Uh, and it's like, I think it's always surprising when they happen and you're like, why didn't it happen earlier? And, you know, I don't know. Mm, interesting. Cool. Um, okay, here's an interesting question, uh, maybe useful for us at Wits and Biases. What kind of visualization tools would be most helpful as we continue to, to build on these models? Or do you have any ideas of what might be helpful for people building on top of these models? Oh, yeah, that's, that's such a great question. Because I think this is like kind of evolving more and more as these models get better and better. Um, you know, it used to be the case where I think kind of all you cared about was really like perplexity and so on as you were training it. It's like that was most of what you were optimizing. But I think we're getting to a point now like where you you kind of, um, you really want to visualize how, uh, like dig into kind of the mistakes that the models are doing and so on. Like you often, we move to a world where I think you can get really far with like prompt prompting and, and, and uh, whether it's like through conversations or a single kind of prompt. Um, and then, but then you will get to some point where you can kind of uh, you, you can fine tune these models to with even more data. And at that point, I, I think the paradigm now is that you don't need a ton of data, but you need to make sure that the data is kind of really, really high quality. So understanding kind of a way to see like where where are mistakes made, how like how do you automatically kind of build? You know, we we ship this this open source library called OpenAI evals that kind of makes it easier for you to build um, automated evals. So I think like that would be a big part of the workflow and ha allowing people to see overall trends, but dig into the examples. Because oftentimes what we find that at the end of the day, like examples are underspecified and so on. And, and so you just need to be so way, way more careful now that like the models are so good uh, that like you're not seeing weird stuff because the model is bad versus like you just had a mistake in your data set. Mm, makes sense. Um, okay. Uh when so I guess uh, here's I guess the summary of this question is how many people worked on GPT four like how many NML engineers did it take to to train this thing? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, it's just like I feel like all of OpenAI worked on this one uh, in, in in one way or another because like we have this whole kind of process like a big like you know it, all the data set work that goes into it, all of the infrastructure engineering that built the data centers that kind of built the. Um, um, uh, the infrastructure on top of those data centers training these models, then the, all the kind of science and stuff that went into actually the pre-training, and then we do this kind of fine-tuning on top with uh, RL from human feedback. You know, so I, I feel like at the end of the day, it's got to be like probably out of the the three hundred plus people at OpenAI, probably at least two thirds of of the company worked on some aspect of this. Okay, and final question. Um, since this is our user conference and you are such a high profile um, user or OpenAI, is, I'm curious if you could say a little bit about how OpenAI uses weights and biases and if you have a favorite um, feature or part of uh, weights and biases. We'd love to know about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we use it for, for pretty much all of our model training. So just like, you know, uh, you, you know, just, just, just tracking them. I think there's a lot of kind of just sharing of like, you know, the fact that you can easily share share uh, share kind of training runs and stuff like that. It's a super used feature. But I think one thing that, you know, these days I, I, I do way, way less of that sort of work. So one of the features I really like is, is kind of the ability to kind of have reports and so on where people, so we use that uh, quite heavily. It depends a little bit on the team, but a number of teams are using that quite heavily to kind of really have clear hypothesis. Here's like the hypothesis. Uh, here, here, here is the, here are the experiments that were run to kind of validate or invalidate that hypothesis. Here's the conclusion. So you have all these like mini scientific papers essentially on all of the stuff that's happening at OpenAI, which is like incredibly interesting to kind of uh, follow along with. Fantastic! That sounds very interesting. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Peter. It's really really nice to have your time, especially so so close to after your your big launch. And congratulations! We're we're loving um, using it internally here. Thank you so much for having me. This was super fun and uh, can't wait to see what you all build with uh, GPT-4. Awesome. Take care.